Hello and welcome to my channel. In this channel, we explain various nursing concepts in a simple form for better and easy understanding. These videos could be used by both LPN and RN students as well as nurses who are trying to refresh their basic concepts. My name is Nas Mosh. So in this video, we're going to talk about diuretic medication, anticoagulants, as well as glycoside medication. So let's start with our diuretic medication. And with diuretics, we have three different types. We have our loop diuretics, potassium sparing, as well as our thiazide diuretics. So our loop diuretics. Our loop diuretics are actually examples include furosemide, Lessix, we know that, right? It's used for either pulmonary edema, edema related to heart failure, liver, or even kidney disease, as well as hypertension. Its mode of action, it blocks the absorption of sodium, chloride, and water at the ascending loop of Henle, which causes rapid diuresis. So when we don't reabsorb this water, we will pee it out. So side effects of this include hypertension, low volume, hypovolemia, hypotension, dehydration, electrolyte imbalances, electrolyte imbalances of like hyponatremia and hypokalemia, autotoxicity, as well as hyperglycemia. With these patients, we really need to watch their blood sugars, okay? This medication is actually administered. We prefer to administer it or it should be administered during the day. This was better for the patient uh, leaving because we don't want them waking all through the night to pee. And it's actually infused uh, 20 milligrams over a minute. What do we teach this patient or our patient education with this patient? We'll weigh this patient daily. We'll monitor the eyes and nose. We'll also monitor the electrolyte imbalances. We'll encourage this patient to consume foods which are rich in potassium and the patients should avoid things like licorice root because it lowers potassium levels because this diuretic is al already a potassium wasting diuretic okay let's talk about potassium sparing diuretic and the example for this is sprinolactin the mode of action for this will it blocks aldosterone letting out sodium and water out of the body remember the ras system if you can remember it refer to our fluid and electrolyte video you'll find the ras system video and aldosterone at the end causes the reabsorption of salt and water and the wasting of potassium so if this aldosterone is not functioning will not reabsorb that salt and water and we are not going to waste the potassium okay so interventions for this kind of patients will include, we always place this patient on a cardiac monitor for any potassium. Always, when a patient is at a risk of potassium imbalances, cardiac monitor is the first thing we need to put them on. And then we'll monitor for some muscle spasm or muscle cramps, which is an indication of potassium levels and which is a big problem. So this potassium levels will be elevated with these cramps and spasms indicates an elevation of potassium. So a key thing you need to know. Some of this states patients on death, uh, individuals on death row, they actually inject them with potassium. So you see how little this medication is or this imbalance is. Actually, potassium pumps the muscle. So with low potassium, right, the heart or the ECG, EKG will indicate a flat T wave or an ST depression or even a U wave, right? Those are the indication you will note with low potassium levels on the ECG. And we never, never administer potassium IV. Potassium is actually administered between one to four hours. It's not a, you know, a push, no. So it's one to four hours and we need to always have this patient patient on a cardiac monitor. So our nursing consideration, we administer it in the morning, like every other diuretic. We teach the patient to change position slowly, hypertension, orthostatic, blood pressure, right? Because we are diuresing. We monitor our weights daily. Any two to three pounds increase per day or five per week, we need to report to the doctor because this patient is actually retaining this fluid. This patient will also be at risk of sunburns, will have them take some, a low sodium diet. Why are we taking a low sodium diet? Because we are not even, we don't want that holding of water. Because whatever sodium goes, water follows. We avoid salt substitutes because this is a potassium sparing diuretic. We avoid over the counter medications. And what are the examples of over the counter medications we need to avoid? Like cough and flu medication, anti acid medication like TOMS, acetamorphine, our NSAID, which include like naproxen or ibuprofen. And why are we avoiding this? They are high in sodium levels, right? And we don't want this increased sodium because it 
and sodium will increase what? Water retention. Our last diuretic will be our thiazide diuretic. An example for this is hydrochlorothiazide. It's commonly used with hypertensive, other hypertensive medications. So treatment for this will include hypertension and edema related to either heart, kidney, or liver disease. You see these organs, right? They work together to push this fluid around the system, the circulatory system. Our mode of action for this will be it blocks the absorption of sodium chloride and water at the distal combustible tube. Okay, side effects of this hydra dehydration. Dehydration is a common thing with diuretics, okay? Hypokalemia, hyperglycemia, okay? Hyperglycemia, like our loop diuretics, we monitor for their blood sugars. It's less risk for autotoxicity compared to our loop diuretics. And what do we educate these patients? Always monitor our eyes and O with our diuretics. We weigh our patients daily, right? Report any weight changes. Two to three pounds per day or five pounds per week. We report it to the medical doctor. We encourage the patient to consume potassium rich food because what? Thiazides and loop diuretics are potassium wasting diuretics. So before we give any kind of diuretic, we always, always check the patient's blood pressure, BUN, and creatinine levels. Why are we checking the blood pressure? We don't want to drop this patient even further, right? Because we are trying to get rid of this fluid. They'll end up with hypovolemia and hypovolemia will lead to hypotension. And for our BUN and creatinine, this our kidney function levels, our kidney function panels, if our kidney is not functioning. So how is this patient going to pee? And some the BUN range that we need uh, to know, the normal range is between 10 to 20 and our creatinine range between 0 0.5 to 1.1 for women and 0 0.6 to 1.2 for Man. So let's talk about our anticoagulants. And with our anticoagulants, we'll talk about either our IV, we have our IV or subcutaneous anticoagulants, and we also have our oral anticoagulants. So let's start with our oral coagulants. Example, warfarin or coumadin. You know that, right? It's used for what? Air feed with thrombus, DVT, PE, pulmonary embolism, or even following an MI to prevent complications. So they put this on patients who experience an MI. Mechanism of action, it antagonizes with vitamin K, which prevents the formation of several clotting formations. So we are thinning this blood clotting process is not occurring. So side effects, of course, when we are messing with coagulation is bleeding. This patient could end up with a GI upset or even hepatitis. We monitor the PTNR levels and which are normally between two to three. It takes up to three to five days to get to this therapeutic level. Okay, so this will not be our first line anticoagulant medication to give a patient. We'll actually start them with an IV or a subcutaneous anticoagulant. Then we win them into the oral one. Okay, so PT is normally between uh, 11 to 13 seconds. When a patient is on warfarin, it should be one to 1.5 times times, one and a half times um, greater than normal, which is 17 to 20 seconds. And always remember the antidote for warfarin is vitamin K. So we educate this patient to maintain what? A consistent vitamin K intake. Because if they mess with vitamin K, then the therapeutic level is not going to work, right? And any patient on anticoagulants, we teach them about what? Bleeding, issues. So heparin or Lovenox are examples of our IV or subcutaneous anticoagulants and heparin use is used for DVTs, any other thrombolytic diseases that require fast anticoagulation, stroke and pulmonary embolism. It works by it activates the antithrombin which inhibits thrombin formation, preventing new clots from forming and the existing clothes from becoming even bigger, but it does not break down clothes. So what breaks down clothes? Thrombolytic agents, not anticoagulants. Okay, remember that. Side effects for this, of course, bleeding. And heparin could induce cytopenia. Patient could have hypersensitivity. And these patients will monitor their A. PTT levels closely and it's normally between 45 to 80 seconds, which is 1.5 to 2 times level above the baseline level. Our antidote for this is protamine sulfate. And of course, this patient should be on bleeding precautions and some things that you'll tell the patient to not will be like coffee ground emesis and tarry stools are indication 
of bleeding. So for this video, I know it's a little bit long, but let's finish up with our cardiac glycosides. An example for this is digoxin. So what is digoxin used? Digoxin is used for various conditions like supraventricular tachycardia, heart failure, arterial fibrillation, arterial flutter. Its mode of action is provides a positive inotropic effect which increases the force of the myocardiac infarction remember positive inotropic increases cardiac contractility and since digoxin is but a positive inotrop and a negative chronotrop so it's a negative chronotrop which affects the affects the what the heart rate so it slows down the heart rate side effects for this of course, we'll have antiarrhythmias like bradycardia. Patient could end up with a dig uh, digoxin toxicity. They will have some EKG changes, anorexia, as well as nausea and vomiting. With anorexia with this, this is not anorexia nervosa. This is the anorexia where it's lack of appetite. So signs and symptoms of digoxin toxicity, you need to know this. GI upset, which includes vomiting. The patient could have anorexia. They could have fatigue. They will have vision issues. The patient will be telling you, I see like a yellow ring. So before we administer digoxin, we always take patient's heart rate. So for heart rates for this, we hold digoxin if the heart rate for an adult is below 60 beats per minute. And we hold it for a child, a school-going child, if the heart rate is below 70 beats per minute. And for an infant, if it's below 90 beats per minute, we do not administer digoxin, okay? We hold it and let the medical provider know. So digoxin therapeutic range is between 0 0.5 to 2. Hypokalemia, which is low potassium, increases the risk of digoxin toxicity. So this patient, we have to make sure or ensure they're not having cardiac imbalances. Why are we talking about potassium issues? So most of our cardiac patients could be on a diuretic. So if they're on a loop diuretic or a thyser diuretic, which is wasting potassium, they are at risk of having this digoxin toxicity. So patients with bradycardia on digoxin can be treated with atropine. Remember, atropine increases the heart rate. It's a positive chronotrop medication. And the antidote for digoxin toxicity is immunofab or DGFAB. So digoxin toxicity will increase with what? What can cause this digoxin toxicity? Of course, we said hypokalemia, dehydration, because when we are dehydrated, it causes increased concentration of our electrolytes, low magnesium, and digoxin has interactions with various things like quinidine, that's a medication, vodka and tonic. Remember that is an ATI, verapamil and amiodarone. And that's it for this video. We'll meet on the next video. Thank you for watching. Please like, share and subscribe to my channel. See you on the next one. Bye.